method of steepest descent. One question that commonly comes up is why does the gradient vector represent the direction of steepest descent? So in the method of steepest descent, as we know, we are following the gradient vector. Okay. So I just want to uh, clarify this a little bit. So again, we go back to that example that we talked about, two by two, so that we can draw things graphically. Okay. <coughs> Notice that A is still a symmetric matrix, okay, because you have two here and two here. So it's symmetric about the diagonal, all right? Uh, so here was our quadratic function that we constructed and minimized, okay? And if I now write this out, let's say for two independent variables, so what I'm showing you now here is uh, basically expanding this guy out. So phi transpose is phi1, phi2, written as a row matrix. Then here's your A matrix, and then this is again your phi. This is now a column vector or a column matrix. Q transpose is 2 minus 8, as you can see. Here's your Q, and then your phi. And what I've done here is I've, I think I've used a value of C equal to 10. Okay. The reason I used C equal to 10 is just so that whatever constant comes out of that multiplication just drops out and you get a zero, okay? Um, you can choose any C for plotting purposes. So I've used uh, C so that the function sort of shifts up or down, and in this case, it's chosen such that you get um, the minima of the function is zero, okay, the value of the function. So now what we are doing here is we are saying, okay, in the method of steepest descent, we are going to follow the gradient of this function f, okay? So what is the gradient? So here is the definition of a gradient, okay? So if f is a scalar, okay, like we have, it's a scalar which is a function of two unknowns, phi1 and phi2, okay? Uh, the gradient operator, basically what it does is it takes the two independent coordinates and then it, you take the partial derivative and, and then the unit vector in that direction. So this is the same as saying if I were to write this in Cartesian coordinates in geometry, you would essentially get something like df dx times i plus df dy times j. Okay. So what I have written here is exactly that except that I'm not using geometric notations i and j for unit vectors, I'm using unit vector along the phi1 direction and unit vector along the phi2 direction, okay? So if you now calculate the partial derivatives from this expression, d phi1, d, uh, df d phi1 and df d phi2, and plug it in, this is what you get, okay? Those two expressions. Now what we do is, we take our initial starting guess, minus 2, minus 2, and we plug in those values in here, here and here. And so this first quantity comes out to be minus 12. The second quantity comes out to be minus 8. So our initial gradient vector at minus 2, minus 2 is minus 12. If you can think of it as minus 12i plus minus 8j, okay? In this figure here, so if you think of this as the x direction and that as the y direction, instead we are writing phi1 and phi2, okay? That's what that vector is going to look like, okay? So it's 3, if you look at this, this is 3 is to 2. So it's 3 units in this direction and 2 units in that direction, okay? So that's what the vector looks like. So that's the direction along which we start to move. Now, what what happens is that you can see here that these are the contour lines. I have one at 25 here and I have one at 20 here, okay? Now it so happens that if you travel along this path right here, okay, you reach the next contour, the next isocontour fastest, okay? That's the easiest path to get to the next contour. If you take any other path, you will reach the next contour later. Okay. Now, of course, um, from a calculus standpoint, this is all infinitesimal change. By next contour, I mean the contour that's infinitesimally away from 25, okay? not necessarily 20. Okay? But uh, geometrically, if you wanted to draw it, that's the interpretation. That that's what's really happening. 
That is why this is known as the method of steepest descent because you are following the gradient and the gradient takes you to the next level the quickest. All right. All right. So, as we saw in the last class, what ends up happening is you travel along this path until you get here. Okay, that's determined by the value of alpha that you get. Okay, and what happens now is after if you keep moving along this path, basically what happens is the value of f increases. You're now going upwards instead of going downwards. Okay, it's kind of difficult to see because you know here kind of if you look at a contour, the contour is like that. So it's kind of hard to see that it's actually the function is going up, but it is if you keep moving along that direction. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> All right. So here's another question. Is there a case when the marching along the gradient will directly lead us to the correct answer? Okay. So in the previous case, we know this, that then it changes direction. The next residual is orthogonal to that, so it's going to go in that way. Then it's going to go some distance and change again and so on. It's going to take the zigzag path down to that final solution. Okay. So we are asking the question, when will it be when, for example, the first vector itself gives me that answer? Is that possible even? Okay. And the answer is yes, if you take the A matrix to be an identity matrix, okay. which we should get. Okay. Remember, identity matrix means we shouldn't have to iterate. So just one step should take us to the exact answer. Okay. Now let's see what happens with the method of steepest descent if we do that. Okay. So first of all, if you take A as the identity matrix, here's your function again. This is what comes out to be your function. And notice that that's actually a equation of a square. You can factorize it nicely okay, and write it or equation of a circle. And you can write that in the form of the equation of a circle. Okay, If you plot it, so by the way, this is what the gradient vector looks like, phi1 minus 2 and phi2 plus 2. Okay, if you plug in minus 2 minus 2, this is what you get as your gradient vector. It's basically along the x direction okay, or the phi1 direction in this case. If you plot it, this is what the function looks like. The function that I had on the previous page, which I said is the equation of a circle. Okay, These are what the contours look like. So now think of this. This is your initial direction vector, which is pointed straight to the final solution. Okay. So another way of thinking of this is instead of, you know, a uh, a stadium-like shape like we have in, uh, you know, the horseshoe, you're now looking at a perfect circular bowl, okay? So when you get down, when you want to get down to the t middle, to the minima, okay, all you do is you follow the gradient where you are standing and that automatically leads you to the middle. You don't have to change any more directions, okay? Now let's see what happens when we actually execute. This is what we get the gradient vector as, and it seems like that's answer. But when we finally execute the algorithm, this is what happens. Okay, so you start with your residual vector. So now I'm going through the steps of the method of steepest descent. Okay, calculate your residual vector. That's your residual vector. Then you calculate your alpha. Okay, which is r transpose r divided by r transpose a r. And I've just calculated it out. It's exactly one. Okay, once you calculate it out. And now you do your update. So you get minus two, minus two, which was your initial guess, times plus one times the gradient vector. Okay. And it gives you the exact answer, two minus two. As it should, as I said. Okay. Because in this case, we have an identity matrix as our coefficient matrix, and therefore, we shouldn't have to iterate. So the method clearly satisfies that limiting condition that if it's an identity matrix, you shouldn't have to iterate. All right? Any questions? So of course, this is all for a 2 by 2 system, just so that we understand things graphically. Okay, But for uh, n by n system, this is all hyperdimensional. You can't even really plot it but it gives us an idea of what's going on, okay? All right, so 
here's the summary again of the method of steepest descent. I have, I have this in uh, the previous lecture notes, but I have just summarized it here. So you start with an initial guess. Okay. So basically, when you start off, k is equal to 0, your iteration index. Okay. And then you calculate the residual at the first iteration or zeroth iteration. And then you update your solution. Okay. You calculate your alpha. Then you update this solution. So this step actually comes before this step. Okay. So you first calculate alpha from the residual. Okay. Then you plug it in here and you update your solution. Okay. And once you have that, then you monitor your convergence. Notice that the numerator here is already the inner product of your residual, which is basically this shows up in the L2 norm. So all you have to do is you just take the square root of what you've already calculated. Don't recalculate it again. Okay. <clears throat> and compare it to the tolerance criterion. And if it doesn't, um, if it converges, then of course you stop. Otherwise, you go back to step two. Okay. Any questions? Now let's talk a little bit about coding. All right. So here is step two of the algorithm. Calculation of the residual. How do we do that? This is all written in matrix form. Are we going to do it using a matrix notation? The answer is no. Okay. And this is where I keep telling the students, get away from MATLAB matrix notations, okay? You're going to be doing more harm to yourself using these matrix operations than if you do it, treat everything as a scalar and run for loops to do every operation, okay? So bad way of doing it is to allocate a square matrix A and then do a vector matrix vector multiplication, which is what you will have to do in MATLAB if you wanted to use matrix notations because this is a square matrix k by k, this is k times 1. So you have to allocate those two matrices, fill them out, and then do a multiplication. Okay? This is actually k square multiplications. Okay? So that's, that's the, that would be the bad way of doing it. The good way of doing it is you just store the five bands of your A matrix, which According to uh, the Stone's method, the notations were E, F, H, D, B. So if you've, let's say, already programmed in the Stone's method, you already have that part filled out. You just cut and paste that code into this code. You already have those. You don't need to redo those. Okay? So those are the five bands uh, of the coefficient matrix. Okay? And now you code in the mat matrix vector multiplication using loops rather than inbuilt MATLAB commands, and this is how it goes, okay? So what you're doing is you're first setting the residual to zero everywhere, so that that colon means the entire vector, I'm setting it to zero, okay? Why am I setting it to zero first? Because I know, for example, at my boundaries, if, my, if I'm using Dirichlet boundary conditions, then those values are never going to change Okay, and I've set my boundary condition equal to the initial guess at the boundaries already. So the residual is zero, and it should just stay zero, not change ever. Okay, so that's what uh, is the purpose of re setting it to zero first. Then what you do is you loop over your i and j, and we are looping over only the interior nodes, as you can see. Okay, because we're not. This is with the assumption that you've Dirichlet boundary conditions everywhere. Okay. So we're looping over the interior nodes. Here is our global index k, and here is our residual calculation, which is taking qk minus ek times phi k minus fk times phi k plus 1 minus hk times phi k plus n, and so on. Okay? Those are the five diagonals corresponding to the five nodes in the stencil. Okay? And you just subtract out each one from q. That's basically q minus a phi. And that requires only 5k operations as opposed to k square operations because you have five multiplications for each value of k. Okay? So that's how you should do your, um, you know, these, these are all written in matrix operations, but don't just blindly do matrix operations. 
It's going to harm you. <clears throat> Another one, step three, requires calculation of alpha. Okay, that's that expression there. So first of all, <clears throat> numerator we have already calculated. So this guy, we have already calculated the R. Okay, now, this guy here, calculating this is simply saying that it's the sum of RK squared. That's all. So again, you don't need to do any matrix operations. You don't need to take the R, make a transpose, and then multiply. All you do is you square and add all the elements. That's all. Okay? <clears throat> Let's talk about the denominator. So what I'm going to do is I've defined Q, this vector, as A times R. So that's this part here. Okay? So how do I calculate it? Exactly the same way as I did the... Um, the a times phi multiplication. So everywhere I have phi, I have replaced it by r. Okay, so if you go back to the previous slide, all these were phi, I replaced them by r because I'm doing a times r instead of a times phi. Okay, exact same loop. So the resulting, uh, the result of this is this q vector. Now I'm going to do r transpose times q. What is that? That's simply in scalar notations, it's simply RK times QK multiplied and then added, okay? Because you're doing R1 times Q1 plus R2 times Q2 plus R3 times Q3 and so on. That's basically what it is, okay? Even though it, it looks like that. So again, don't transpose your R and then construct a Q vector and then use matrix multiplications. It's wasteful, all right? So once you do this, this RTQ is nothing but your denominator. This is just one number. It's a scalar number. This top here is another number, which is this guy. The denominator is this guy, RTQ. So your alpha is whatever you can call this, you know, some R or something like that. So your alpha is nothing but some R divided by RTQ. And your L2 norm, which we are calling R2, is simply square root of some R. That's it. <clears throat> okay. Any questions? All right.